Amen. Well, tonight we'll be spending some time in Acts chapter 8, and uh, the title of my message is Be Effective in Difficult Times. All of us go through difficult times. How do you stay effective as a child of God, even in difficult times? Because in a difficult time, it is the natural thing is to hunker down and to ride out the storm and just sit still. But God has different plans. God wants to use times like these in our lives. Now, as we get into this text, as a background, we are continuing. And we remember that um, a few weeks ago, we spoke about uh, there was some, um, something happening in the church. Some people were unhappy because some of their widows were being overlooked with the distribution of the food. So they appointed seven men to help with the distribution, the practical things in the church, in that which needed to happen. And they were looking for men with good reputation, filled with the Holy Spirit, and flowing in wisdom. Now, one of these men was Stephen. And Stephen uh, was full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, and there were some uh, of the Jews that wanted to confront him and speak about Jesus. And he, through his wisdom, he just totally confounded them. They couldn't, didn't have anything to say back to him. So, because of this, they stirred up the crowd, and they brought up false accusations against him and got him in front of the Sanhedrin. Now, what's wonderful to me, just as a side note, is this is so encouraging to know that these men, they were actually chosen to do physical work, doing practical things in the body. But God uses everyone. And many times people think, well, I can maybe help with some practical things, but I don't know enough. I'm not good enough. How can God really use me to impact the lives of people spiritually? We know that God uses everyone, and we must all strive for that, to be part of what God wants to do. Now, when Stephen was speaking to them, he accused them of being stiff-necked and um, uncircumcised of heart and that their ears were closed and that they were the ones murdering that murdered the Messiah. And when they heard this, they got so angry with him, they dragged him out and they stoned him. Now, we sp spent some time on this a few weeks ago. But after this event, a firestorm of persecution rose up against the church. And Saul, you'll remember, Saul was the one that they put their clothes before his feet so that he could keep it for them while stoning Stephen. He was the one that was given authority by the leaders to go after all those who believed in Christ, after the church. And he was entering into the houses of people, and he was dragging them out and said, do you believe in Christ? Dragging them out, putting them in prison, and even stoning some of them. Now, you can see that as a result of this persecution, um, the church scattered. The church in Jerusalem scattered to all over the area around them, to Judea and Samaria. Only the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. Now, what do we make of all of this? Because everything was going so well with the church. And they were together, and they were busy in fellowship, and they were eating together, and sharing meals, and sharing everything they had, and spending time in the Word, and they were seeing miracles and wonders, and it was just a wonderful time. But was this what God asked them to do? Because when we see what Jesus said in Acts verse 1, verse 8, He said, Go and be my witnesses in Jerusalem that they were doing but also in Samaria and Judea and to the rest of the world. God was not calling them to cluster like a kibbutz and just stay together. God called them to do something else. So this chapter in the book of Acts is about taking the gospel out and leading others to Christ. But it's also about what it means to have an authentic faith when responding to the gospel. And how is God going to use them even in this trouble? So in this chapter, we will follow the story of Philip. He's one of the seven men that was chosen to distribute the food. But after the persecution, he leaves Jerusalem. And God will fulfill his plan through Philip. And in this story, he will share the message of Christ with two people. And they will have very different 
responses. And we can learn from this and apply this to our lives so that we will also have authentic faith. So let's get into the word. We're going to be reading from Acts 1, from uh, Acts 8, from verse 1. So Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death, speaking about Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in the city. Now, here's the first guy. There was a man named Simon, who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours, and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourself, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Verse 25. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah, the prophet, and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does this prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from the scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, 
Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. God bless his wonderful word. So we find here, after the persecution, many things start to happen. And what we, the first thing we learn from this is that when something is happening, you must be moved by God. You must be willing to be moved by God for what he wants to do. Because the church was being turned upside down. Their peaceful community is broken up. But God uses this for his glory. But as we have seen, authentic faith trusts God even through trouble. In fact, one of the principles of God's word is that God often uses trouble to accomplish his purposes in our lives. We grow more through trouble than through good times. Amen? But faith is the key. Many times when people go into great difficulty, they want to know why these things are happening. Pastor, why is this happening? Why, why is this coming on my path? Why is God allowing this? Did I sin? What's going on? What is God's plan with this? But God does not often give explanations. But faith trusts God's heart for you. And faith trusts God's hand to lead you. If we know that we know that we know that God loves us, God's plans towards us are good, then we can even in the situation of trouble trust God. But you need to know when God is on the move. Because see, when difficulties and persecution and challenges arise, that's when you need to watch what God is doing. Someone once said, the enemy only attack those who are a threat to him. If you're not under attack, maybe you're not a threat. Now, when persecution and trouble times come, that's when we need to watch. What is God busy doing? In fact, it's in times of ease and complacency that the church becomes ineffective. We could use this, correlate this to an army of a country. When a country becomes complacent and their standing army doesn't train, they are in great peril. Great trouble can come against them. And many countries have learned by now that you must always be at the ready. Always be training. Don't become complacent. That's why our army trains even when there is no war. So that when the need arises, they are ready. See, complacency is a horrible thing. However, if your faith is shipwrecked and you're angry with God because you're going through trouble then your lack of faith and a bitter heart will cause you to miss what God is doing. Don't get bitter towards God when you experience troubled times. That's the attack of the enemy. That's when we need to stand in faith. We need to stand in truth and say, I don't understand this, no, but I trust God. You'll remember the story of Joseph. Joseph, when he was thrown in a pit then sold as a slave, then went into Potiphar's house, then was accused wrongly, thrown into prison. Oh, my word. If there is one man that could have said, God, what are you doing? It was Joseph. Yet, when he met his brothers, he said in Genesis 50 verse 20, he told them, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. When the famine struck, God had already placed him in the right position to be able to save a multitude and in essence, save the bloodline through which the Messiah would come. God was in this. And although he couldn't see it, he was trusting God. And in the same way, we need to trust God. 
God. And we see here in the book of Acts, God uses this persecution, this attack against the church to disperse them through Judea and Samaria. And soon the gospel will spread throughout the cities of the known world. And I wrote a note here, an extra note, this morning as I went through my sermon that says, what the enemy meant for evil, God will turn it for good. And it was such an encouraging thing to my heart that that is the song we sang just before this message came. What the enemy means for evil. He thinks he is doing a check move, but God has the last move. God always has the last move. Now notice in verse 4 that those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. They weren't discouraged or they faced shipwrecked. They went on and went around telling people of what God has done. So Philip even went to the Samaritans. Now you will know if you've studied the Bible a bit that the Jews did not like the Samaritans. They didn't speak to them. They saw them as a type of a half-breed. They looked down on them. But when Philip went into that place, something changed in his heart. He had the heart of God. He saw people in need of God. He cared for them. And this is where that saying comes, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Every person that Jesus encountered was changed because they could sense that he loved them and he cared for them. And see, God is on the move and Philip wants to be moved by God. He has taken hope, hold of hope. Even though I don't understand God, I will stand on hope. And hope isn't something that I know. It's something that I trust for. Hebrews 6, 18, 19 says, We who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. See, there's a hope before you, but you need to take hold of it. You need to apply it. You need to say, God, I choose to take hold of that which is the hope. It's your choice. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Do you need an anchor for your soul? Does it feel like your soul is fluttering in the wind? Take hold of the hope of Christ. Take hold of the hope of his love. Take hold of him. Both sure and steadfast. It can never be shaken. But sometimes you need to get yourself out of the way. And we see this, as Philip is sharing the gospel in Samaria, God was also doing signs and wonders, and unclean spirits were coming out of people, and even the lame started to walk. But then this man named Simon comes on the scene. The first one that we want to speak about. What an interesting story this is. So, Simon, as we've read, was quite famous in this area. He was doing um, astonishing things through magical arts, through the occult. And this whole city was amazed with him to such an extent that they said he was working the great power of God. And here's a lesson. People are fooled by counterfeit when the power of God is not there. But as soon as the true power of God shows up, the counterfeit is shown. So in verse 9, it says that he claimed to be someone great. The problem was that he was a fake. He was definitely not the power of God. But God can take someone from any background and transform him and use his life for his glory, but you have to let go of the old things. There were still things in Simon's life that he didn't want to let go. He still wanted people to look at him a certain way. But you need to let go. Otherwise, those things will still have a grip on you. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. That's a great euphemism for the old things is dead, deader, deadest. It's gone. Behold, new things 
have come. We need to let go of all the old things, all the old insecurities, all these old things that define us so that the new can come. Now we see that Simon made a profession of faith and was even baptized. However, is it possible to believe and yet not be saved? See, James 2.19 says the following. It says, you believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe, and they shudder. I submit to you that the demons have seen Christ in all his glory. They might even believe more than you and I. Yet they shudder. Doesn't mean they're saved. John 2, 23 to 25, now when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. Jesus knew that they saw what he was doing, but their hearts were not after him. See, Simon had enough experience in the occult to discern that this what was happening was real. But he didn't give his heart over to God. But this is what God asks of us, to submit our heart to him. Romans 10.10, 10, know the scripture. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. God, I believe. God, I trust you. I place my trust in you with my whole heart. The thing is, Simon wanted to manipulate the Spirit. But the Spirit of God is not manipulated by saying the right words. He was used to doing incantations and having power over other occultic things. And he wanted to have power over the Spirit. But it doesn't work that way. The Spirit is not subject to our leading. We are subject to His. We are used of the Spirit based on our relationship with Him. And listen to this. This is very important. And what God knows we can be trusted with. People come to me sometimes and say, but I pray for people and I've never seen someone's leg be healed or someone's arm growing or a blind being healed. Why doesn't it happen? Well, one of the things I think maybe is that sometimes God is protecting you because you're not ready for it. Maybe if that happens, you'll get so proud, I'm such a wonderful Christian, that it will take you to wrong places. Now, this is just my opinion. But God knows what he wants to do and who he wants to use in what situation and what is needed. We are led by the Spirit, not the other way around. Deuteronomy 10, 12 says the following. What does God want? What does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God. That fear is to stand in reverent awe of Him. To walk in all His ways. Why? Because He wants good for us. Walk in His ways and love Him. Why? Because he loved us first. And to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So here's the problem. When Simon saw the Spirit was bestowed to the, them laying hands on them, he offered them money. He wanted this power. Today, if we see someone paying money for a, for a position of influence, we call it simony after this man, Simon. Now, what's interesting is that he could have had this all for free. Because when your heart is right with God, God bestows the gifts freely. He gives what is needed. But his heart was that people would once again see him as the great power of God. God people would once again praise him that he had this power to exert. His heart was not what the Spirit was given for. What was the Holy Spirit given for? To correct, to help, to build up the church. The gift is there to build up people and grow them in Christ. He wanted a power play. He wanted authority over the spirit. But then Peter said to him, your heart is not right before God. 
What does this mean? Simon is in the way of God moving in his life. What an amazing lesson. In the way of God moving in his life. We can be standing in the way of God moving in our lives. You know how? If you come to God with conditions, God, I will allow this, but you must do this. Or you can do this, but not this. It makes me think of a while ago, I, I um, heard this principle that when they train lifeguards who are rescuing people, there's something interesting they tell them. When people are drowning, there's so much adrenaline and the anxiety is so high that they keep on struggling and fighting. And if the lifeguard comes close to them, they might evil even attach on him and they're so frantic trying to get on top that they might try and drown the lifeguard. So one of the principles is you need to come close to someone and wait till they are ready to be saved. Isn't that interesting? When they are willing to surrender to you, to hook them in and start to swim. If they resist you, let them go. Until they stop struggling, and then you can take them when they relent, when they surrender. Now, this is a clumsy analogy because Jesus can never be drowned. He's always strong enough, but he will not overpower your will. If you surrender, if you relent, he will save you. But if you are fighting and kicking against the goats, he will leave you alone. He will not force you until you come to a place to say, God, your will be done. Many, pe many times people still want their own wills to be done. And that's part of dying to the self. And here's the truth. The irony is that God knows best. He knows what's the best for you. He knows what's the best for me. And when I stop kicking against it and follow his lead, he will lead me to beautiful places. Now, Peter told him to repent of this wickedness and to pray for forgiveness. But Simon says the following, pray to the Lord for me yourselves. And I submit to you that this is not going to work. I cannot pray you into heaven. You need to surrender to God. I can pray and pray God convict this person. God draw them closer. God open their hearts and their eyes so that they will surrender to you. But it is a personal thing. Every person needs to surrender for themselves. God, here I am. This is between you and God. And the principle is to let God move through you. If we want to be effective in difficult times, we need to let God move through us. Now it says after this debacle with Simon, they started back to Jerusalem. But Philip, an angel of the Lord, appeared to Philip and told him to arise and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now there were two main roads to Gaza. And this one was the worst one, because it was a desert road. Now, sometimes God can call you to a desert road for a bigger purpose that you cannot see. See, Philip could have thrown a tantrum. He said, God, really? I just did all these wonderful things in Samaria. Demons coming out of people. Lame being healed, and now you tell me to go to a desert road? But God was directing his steps. And he knew that he was just on an adventure, and God knew what he was doing. God was going to move through him. And I believe that if you are surrendered to God, he will by his spirit work in you to will and to work according to his will. Do you know, and I said this before, God will not ask you to do anything that you don't want to do. You say, Pastor, how is that possible? Because God works in you to do what he wants to do. Sometimes I look at all these missionaries that we support, 
And I look at the places where they work, and I think, God, how does that happen? I don't have a specific passion for what they're busy doing. And when I was speaking to God about this, he says that everyone is called for something specific. No one took these missionaries with chains and dragged them on the plane, and them yelling, I don't want to go. No, they have a passion. They have an unction in them. They have compassion for where they are going. They want to be there. God worked it in his heart. As soon as they surrender, God work in your heart. Nobody's forcing me to preach and teach here this evening. I love it. Nobody forces me to lead worship. I love it. God is working it in your heart. What is God working in your heart? Are you surrendered that God can work in your heart so that you can do what he wants to do? If you want to be used by God, be effective in difficult times. Say, God, change my heart. God, come and do what you want to do. An interesting um, thing that happened with us was when we were here two and a half years ago, we were praying about um, this call to come to this church. And we really knew that God wanted this. And we were convicted in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And we had this excitement of what was happening. And um, as we went home, we told our kids. And um, everything, we prepared everything. And put our house in the market and started selling our things. And took the kids out of school and put them in homeschooling. Because it would only be two or three months until we get here. And then COVID hit, and we're locked down, and we've got all these plans and all these ideas and all these things that God's calling in our hearts already here, and God says, not yet. And then we get all these obstacles and things happening in the physical and in the spiritual, and uh, USCIS gives trouble and denies our stuff, and we have to, and miracles happen, and it's just such a beautiful, long story. Maybe one day I'll share it with you, how God just miraculously moved. But I remember there were a few times in this journey that we thought, is this really going to happen? I remember my daughter told us, are we still really going to America? After two years, we're still waiting. And every time we hear you say, Dad, no, they said only a month or two, only another month, only another month. When is this happening? And at some stage, my wife and I said, you know what? Maybe we must just stay. And I told her, what do you feel the moment that you say those words? She says, I feel like I'm dying. There's no life in those words. If I have to stay, God has called me somewhere. God has called me. See, there's a conviction. There's a change in the spirit when God calls you. You know that you know. And sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's a desert road. Sometimes it's not easy. But you know that you know that you know this is God's plan. Because see, something beautiful happens with him. On this road, he meets a man from Ethiopia. And I believe there's no coincidences. I believe that God makes divine appointments. Amen? It just so happens that he's at the right place at the right time to speak into this man's life. And it just so happens that this man is busy reading from Isaiah 53. And it just so happens that he came back from Jerusalem perplexed, wanting to know what's going on. God makes divine appointments. I saw that just last week, and it's such a small little thing, but it really encouraged my heart. We were praying with two people to ask for prayer, um, going through a rough thing, a prolonged illness. And in the last minute, I asked my wife, will you please come and pray with me? She said, yeah, it's fine. And as we sat praying, this woman looked at my wife. She said, I'm so glad you're here. Because the things you are saying is speaking into my life from a woman's perspective. So glad you're here. And immediately, I just thought, you know what? It was just a quick thought in my mind. Just ask your wife. And God had a divine appointment in that moment. If we are open, even in the smallest things, God wants to use us. Now, when this Ethiopian had a question, Philip had to be ready to give an answer. You see, Philip was being led by the Spirit, and he comes upon this eunuch, 
uh, Ethiopian eunuch, and he, by the way, is a high-ranking official because he is working for Candace, queen of Ethiopia. He was in charge of her treasure. So this Ethiopian doesn't know it yet, as I said, but he was led by the Spirit of God to be there, reading from exactly the right piece of Scripture. But then he asked a good question, and Philip had to be ready. And we need to be ready as well. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. We should be ready. And I believe that Philip was ready because he sat under the teaching of the apostles. He was training the same way that we are training, spending time in the Word getting productive and being effective as the church. Then secondly, to be effective in difficult times, you need to believe with all your heart. From verse 35, we get the idea that Philip taught him many things in the scriptures. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, what prevents me from being baptized? So Philip answered, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. With the heart you believe, and with the mouth you confess. Romans 10.10. 10. God wants us to believe with all our heart. And you know what? Belief is never sure. Because that's what faith is. Faith is there's always that small percentage that you don't know. But you take everything you know beyond a reasonable doubt and you put your trust in it. God, I'm not dead sure where you're taking me tomorrow. But I'm going to trust and believe that you know best. That's what faith is when I don't know. That's faith. To love him because he first loved us and to trust him with all our lives. So, after they got off the carriage, they got into the water, and Philip baptized this man. And then something amazing happens. As they come out of the water, the Spirit of God transports Philip 30 miles away. Wow. You can look at any Marvel movie, and you see all these people doing that. That's only science fiction. I tell you, God is the real deal. But Philip didn't decide, I want to quickly transport there. No. He was once again led by the Spirit. The Spirit used him. Why? Because there was another job to go and do there. We read that he went around that area preaching the gospel. Something amazing happened. God transported him 30 miles away. Can you imagine that scene? This man coming out of the water. And as soon as he stands up, the guy next to him is gone. Can you imagine? And you know what I love about this? It says that this man went on rejoicing in God. And I believe that this was a sign and a miracle for him as well. Because God wanted to use this man. Some believe that this is where the, the church in Africa started. He moved into Ethiopia and went to spread the gospel, and the church took hold in Ethiopia. God wanted him to know, to trust, and to believe. Because if Philip was just transported as they were sitting on the wagon, he might have thought, I've fallen asleep. And I've just dreamt all of this. But now he was standing in the water, and suddenly this man is gone. He knew that he was awake because he was still wet. And this man was here because he baptized him. Yet there's this miracle, this man is gone. This must be God. God did something amazing. But two things were necessary. And we'll close with this. The first thing, there needed to be a man who was obedient. Philip. And secondly, a heart that was ready to re receive. A heart that said, God, I want you. A heart that says, God, I don't want to be like Simon. I don't want to try and manipulate the Spirit to get my will. 
to do what I want so that I can get my will be done on earth. That is the work of the enemy. As a side note, I don't know if you know what one of the, the biggest law in the satanic Bible that is written is, your will be done. My own will be done. That's what the enemy wants for you. He wants you to follow your own will because he knows it leads into destruction. God wants a beautiful life. And there's only two types of people standing before God. God has two answers one day when you stand before him. You can either say, your will be done, or God will say to you, your will be done. Will you say, God, your will be done? Or will God say to you, your will be done? Because your will be done is separation from God. God can and wants to move through your life. Even in difficult times. The question is, are you willing and available to God? Are you willing to be used? Are you available, even in troubled times, even when you're walking on a desert road, to say, God, I don't understand this, but your will be done. Because I believe every problem is an opportunity for God to do something amazing. He has the last move. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that in moments like these, Holy Spirit, you are ministering to our hearts. And I want to pray for every person at this moment who is in a place of confusion. Saying, God, I don't know what's going on. Kicking against the goat, struggling anxiously. Father, thank you that we know that you are the one that we can rest in. And I pray that you will tonight, that you will, sur you will reveal your heart of love, your heart of compassion, your faithfulness of a loving, good, good Father who will never leave us. And Lord, even though it seems like we're on a desert road or there's some difficulties around us. We know that you will take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. We surrender our hearts to you and we pray that you will work through us, work in us to do and to will according to your promises. Church, tonight I want to ask, is there any of you that say, God, I just want to surrender to your will more and more. With a show of hands, you can just say to God, I just want to surrender more to you, even though I don't understand. I just surrender to you. In my daily walk, in my spiritual life, thank you that you use me. Thank you that I can surrender to you, even in difficult times, because I know that you are there. Lord, we want to surrender to your spirit. Holy Spirit, come and use us. Use us for your glory. Use us to be effective for that which you want accomplished in this life so that your kingdom may come and that your will be done. Your life will move on this earth. We honor you for that in the wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. We're going to partake of the communion.